Welcome back, everyone, to Furthering Christendom. I am your co-host, Mike DeVito, here with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And today we have another special guest. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kayser is Professor of Philosophy and director, uh, director of Ethics at Loyola Marymount University. Um, and anybody who's been in the philosophy of religion world, ethics world, um, has come across Dr. Kayser's work. I mean, just written in extensively in a number of areas, philosophy of religion, theology, ethics, which we'll be talking about today. Um, really, really great book here, The Ethics of Abortion. Uh, I know anybody who's taken an ethics graduate level class has probably come in contact with that. And so incredibly honored, incredibly grateful to have Dr. Kayser here. Dr. Kayser, how are you doing? Thanks you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for that kind introduction, Mike. It's nice to be here. Well, very good. Well, thanks for, for coming and uh, we'll go ahead and kick it off. So. Great. Uh, in your work, uh, you use a particular phrase, you use prenatal humans uh, as a, a term, sort of an alternative word to fetus. Can you explain why uh, you do that? Yeah, so the word fetus is uh, a word that can have a proper usage. It's a kind of medical term, and the corresponding medical term for a woman is called a gravida. Uh, so for instance, if a woman is having her first baby, she's called a prima gravida. And if you're in a medical context to call a woman who's about to have a baby a prima gravida is perfectly fine. But most of the time, right, you're not in a kind of technical medical context when you're talking about pregnancy. So if you have a pregnant friend, you don't call her a gravida. And if uh, you have a pregnant friend, the, uh, the entity she's carrying is a, a baby. That's what she would call it. And that's what you would call it, you'd say, when's your baby due? You wouldn't say, when's your fetus due? If a friend of yours has a miscarriage, you don't say, oh, tough luck, you lost a fetus, it doesn't really matter. You say, I'm so sorry that you lost the baby. And when you're talking to a pregnant woman, uh, sometimes it's appropriate to ask the, the woman, uh, who is the father? Uh, and that's indicative that um, she is the mother and a mother and father create a uh, human being. So I, in using the term prenatal human being, I wanted to find a term that was scientifically accurate. And I think this term is, is scientifically accurate. Um, you are talking about a human being. The entity in question has a human mother and a human father. It has human DNA. It has human blood. It has a human heart. And so it's proper to describe this entity, this individual, as a human being. But of course, the human being isn't yet born. And so you could call the human being an unborn human being. Um, but I kind of like the word prenatal. Um, and the reason I like it is that, you know, women take prenatal vitamins, they have prenatal checkups. I mean, it's a word that's, that's commonly used and it's an accurate scientific word. So I think that the term prenatal human being is a, is a term that doesn't beg questions. It doesn't dehumanize uh, the human being in question. It's accurate, it's scientific, and it's also uh, commonly used. So anyway, that's the reason I like to use the term uh, prenatal human being. Yeah, I, I, I think it's great. Uh, I notice whenever I'm talking with uh, people who are pro-choice um, and I start using the term prenatal human, uh, very uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and and there, is, there is something that, you know, in popular debate in the media, right, it's when does life begin, you know, or the, the idea is that there's actually debate whether the, the fetus is a living human organism, but that's just not the case in the bioethics literature. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Um, you're right that in, in everyday disputes or whatever, sometimes people ask questions like, well, you know, when does life start? We don't know. Even the Supreme Court in 1973 in the notorious Roe versus Wade case said, well, we can't come to an answer to this difficult question that's puzzled people forever. But I actually think that that isn't uh, in accordance with the scientific facts that we know. So if you think about it from a scientific perspective, uh, there's no problem at all uh, determining whether something is a living individual or not a living individual. So if you take something that's not living like this cup that I have in my hand, this is not a living thing. It's not growing proportionately. It's not ingesting nutrition from the outside. It's not maintaining homeostasis. And if you look at, say, you or me or uh, any other human being, we are living creatures, right? We're taking in nourishment from the outside. We need to do that regularly, otherwise we die. We're growing. Uh, 
even adults still are growing new skin cells, new blood cells, and we are maintaining homeostasis, right? A proper temperature and balance. And so, you know, we can distinguish between living organisms and things that are not living. Now, if you apply those scientific criteria to the question of a prenatal human being, it becomes quite obvious that this is a living entity. Uh, this individual is growing, this individual is assimilating nutrition, this individual is maintaining homeostasis, and most importantly, this individual can die. Only living things can die, but everybody recognizes that there's miscarriages, there's abortion, a fetus obviously can die. The same thing's true uh, of a zygote. So the, the fact is that all available scientific evidence confirms that the zygote, the fetus, the human newborn, the human toddler, the human adult are living organisms. There's no scientific evidence at all that these individuals are not living. So then the next question would be, well, if this is a living organism, what species does it belong to? And I think the answer to that is uh, very obvious from a scientific perspective. You have a human mother and a human father that provide human gametes that create a new life. And this new life can only be a human being. It's literally impossible that a human mother and a human father using human gametes could produce out of that union, you know, a dog, a cat, a fish, a tree. It's literally impossible, right? Only if it's two human beings, the only thing they're gonna produce is another human being. And so if you take a look at the DNA of this individual, you'll find human DNA. If you take a tissue sample, you'll find human tissue. So this is a living, unique human being. And then the next thing that's important to consider is, well, should all human beings have human rights or just human beings like me? So there are many times in history where you say, well, human beings like me should have human rights. If you're a man, you should have human rights. If you're a woman, no. If you're white, you should have human rights. If you're a person of color, no. If you're European, you should have, person, you can, you should have personal rights. If you have my religion, you should have human rights. But if you're not those things, you shouldn't. But I've noticed every single time we've ever made that sort of division between human beings that deserve human rights and human beings that don't deserve human rights, we've always made a horrible mistake. So I think it's wise in this case to be inclusive. I think we should include all human beings within the scope of human rights, and that would include human beings after birth and also human beings prior to birth. Yeah, we have a pretty sucky track record as humans. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, sometimes when I talk to my pro-choice friends, I say, okay, you think that prenatal human beings don't deserve human rights. Okay. Can you give me other examples of human beings that you think don't deserve human rights? And they never can. It's sort of like they carve out this special exception, this random arbitrary exception for one class of human beings. But right. they don't think any of these other cases that I described were at all justified. And in fact, they're horrified by all those things. We're horrified when the powerful take advantage of those that are powerless. And if there's any group of human beings that's lacking power, if there's any group of human beings that's vulnerable, those who are at the very beginning of life fall into that category. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a, a great summary. Thank you. Um, so what you know viewers might not realize is that the debate not uh, isn't over whether uh, the prenatal uh, human is a human right if the fetus is a human but rather uh, if it's a person right that's typically um, the where the dialectic is at and so uh, i believe in your work you give a definition something like you know subject s is a person if and only if s has a ra possesses a rational nature right mm -hmm. so, something like that and so I, I wanted to see what you thought, why should we prefer this definition over say, uh, subject S as a person, if and only if S has brain activity or S is conscious or something like that. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, so I think that when we look at alternative views of what a person is or an individual that has dignity and rights, um, I think that different problems sometimes arise for different versions. So let's take the one you suggested, uh, suggested about um, an individual is a person if the individual is conscious. I think that if we think about it, this way of distinguishing human beings that have rights from those that don't clearly fails. And this fails most obviously and clearly, I'd say in the case of human beings that are in surgery. 
So if you, God forbid, get into a car accident today, you're rushed to the emergency room, they have to do emergency surgery, the anesthesiologist is gonna put you under and you're gonna be completely without consciousness for you know four or six hours, who knows how long. But it's obviously the case that you wouldn't suddenly lose your human rights. It's obviously not the case that, well, it's fine to kill Tyler. After all, he's unconscious and you need consciousness in order to have basic human rights. Now, some people would say, well, yeah, but Tyler was conscious before and now he lost his consciousness. So as long as you had consciousness at some prior point, then you um, are a person. The trouble with that view though, is that the very same people who hold that view typically hold that if you lose consciousness permanently, well, then you also lose your personhood and you lose your rights. So I don't think they're really consistent about the idea that consciousness sort of gives you your, your human rights. Um, another problem with this idea is that there's all kinds of non-human creatures that are conscious. I mean, a dog is conscious of its environment. Uh, even a fish is conscious of, you know, the shark coming up trying to eat the fish and so the fish swims away. So if you really held that any kind of consciousness was enough to give you distinctive human rights and basic protection by the law, well, you'd have to hold that fish and dogs and cats and rats all deserve protection. Now you can get out of that problem by saying, well, no, it's not any kind of consciousness. You need higher consciousness. You need a distinctly human consciousness. Like for instance, you need to be aware that you exist. You need to value your own existence. And if you have that kind of consciousness, then you deserve basic human rights. The trouble with that though, is that this kind of consciousness doesn't arise in human beings until they're about two years of age. So if you held that view consistently, you have to also say that post-birth abortion is morally acceptable because uh, say a one-year-old doesn't have self-awareness, doesn't know that he or she exists over time in different places and doesn't value their own existence. After all, that's part of the reason that say a one-year-old is completely unafraid of dying because a one-year-old doesn't even understand the concept of death, doesn't even know they could die. So little tiny children, again, you can you know put a gun to their head. They're, they're not going to be scared at all because they don't even know what a gun is, they don't know what death is, they don't know they exist, it doesn't matter to them. So almost no one thinks that the right to life kicks in at the age of two. So for reasons like this, I think that the idea that uh, an individual needs consciousness to have basic rights is an idea that is worth rejecting. Yeah, uh, are you familiar with uh, Beckwith's uh, Uncle Jed uh, scenario where uh, an individual, your uncle gets into uh, a car accident, goes into a coma. This is, uh, you're told that likely he will be in this state for about nine months. And when he gets out, he'll lose all memories and beliefs and, you know, that sort of thing. He'll have to relearn everything as basically he's an analogous state to that of a, a fetus or a prenatal human. Uh, do, you, do you like that sort of uh, response? Do I like Beckwith's response? Yes, I, th I think it's interesting. I had, I had heard that before. Um, I hadn't read it lately, so I'm not sure I could have, you know, right, 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 right. It, you know, the way you did. But no, I had read that before, and it does seem like a reasonable response because um, if you hold, basically, the, the response brings up the idea that it isn't necessary for you to have uh, consciousness in order to have uh, right. value. And one of the arguments that I actually am growing more and more to like, which is uh, in a way similar to Beckwith's, but 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 also different is by an atheist philosopher named Don Marcus, or Don Marquis. His view is that um, if we want to think about why infanticide is wrong or why abortion is wrong, we should think about why it's wrong to kill you or me. So if you were to kill me today, or I were to kill you today, that wouldn't take away your past, right? You still would have had the nice things in your past. But if you kill me today or you kill you today, what it does is it takes away your future. So you won't have the good friendships that you would have made in the future. You wouldn't enjoy the good meals you would have loved. You wouldn't see the movies you would have liked. All the great things that are in our future, all the uh, art we'd enjoy, all the movies we'd see, all the music we'd listen to, and the friendships we'd have are all taken away. So that's why it's wrong to kill you or me. Now, a similar reason is present for killing a newborn human being or killing a prenatal human being. If you kill a newborn human being or you kill a prenatal human being, you are also taking away that individual's future of value. So they're not gonna be able to have friends. They're not gonna graduate from kindergarten. They're not gonna have their first kiss. They're not gonna be able to 
get married or have kids or go to the movies or walk on the beach or do any of the other things that we can do. So the reason that it's wrong to kill you or me is that killing you or me takes away a future like ours. And likewise, the reason it's wrong to kill a newborn human being or a prenatal human being is it takes away their future like ours. Yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, very good. Thank you. Um, did have one more question. Mike, do you mind if I ask one more sure. question before you? No, can... no, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. All right. So you probably know what's coming, right? You see some smoke, you see some fire. Ah, I do know what's coming, yes. <laughs> and um, you have the ability to save, you know. Either uh, my, my uh, Depeche Mode uh, music or uh, a child, right? Is that it? <laughs> Something like that. Something like that, okay. Yeah, so you, you can save, you know, let's say 10 embryos, 20 embryos, something like that. Uh, or one particular child, uh, who do you save? You know, how, what, how's a pro-lifer supposed to, to reason here? And, and if he chooses the child or if she chooses the child to save, does this somehow discount the idea that those embryos should be considered as persons? Yeah, what I would say is that in cases in which you are trying to save those in danger of death, um, the principles that you use don't involve a denial of the humanity of others. So think about when the Titanic sunk. When the Titanic sunk, they sent out a cry, uh, women and children first. Now, I don't think anyone thought at that time that, oh, well, this is a denial of the basic humanity and of the, the basic human rights of all the males, adult men, on the ship. This is clearly a way of saying that they don't count and they're second class and they're not persons and that it's fine to kill them whenever you want. So in all kinds of cases, when we can only save some and not all, we choose to save the ones that we can save. Now, what principles should we use? Should we say women and children first? Should we not? Well, we can talk about that. I think it's a worthwhile question. Um, but let me give a different example. Let's say you can save 10 regular people, or you can save the Pope, the Prime Minister of England, or the President. Who should you save? Well, if you kill the Pope, the Prime Minister, or, or rather, if the Pope or Prime Minister or President dies, that death has, uh, and, or can have at least, catastrophic effects on the human community. That killing a regular person like me or allowing a regular person like me to, to die wouldn't have. So if I die, you know, I think my wife would be sorry. I hope she'd be sorry. Um, I think my kids would be sad. You know, my parents would be sad but it's not gonna be a world-altering cataclysmic event. Whereas the death of a world, world leader really can be. As you probably know, World War I was started by the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand. And so, you know, sometimes when a world leader dies, it causes catastrophic you know, negative consequences for many. So, but if you say were to choose to save the Pope or president or prime minister, rather than just 10 regular people, that's not, again, saying that those 10 regular people aren't really persons, don't have basic human rights, et cetera. So the principles that, that govern uh, triage cases, in other words, cases in which you can only save some, uh, should not be taken to mean that those that you don't save, therefore lack human rights, can be killed at will, et cetera. So how does this apply to rescuing either the child, a 10-year-old child, say, or 10 human embryos? What I'd say is this that if you chose to save the 10-year-old child, that is not making a judgment that the 10 embryos aren't really persons, don't really have rights to live, et cetera. Um, rather, it's a judgment that the 10-year-old child, for instance, is going to be terrified if she's allowed to die in the fire. The 10-year-old child has parents that are gonna be horrified and devastated if their child dies. If you have abandoned embryos in the lab, there are abandoned embryos in the lab that clearly their parents are not horrified if they're not there. They don't even keep track of them enough to take care of them. That's why they're frozen in a lab. Uh, moreover, the 10-year-old child has all kinds of existing relationships to classmates, to relatives, to grandparents, et cetera, and that makes uh, the situation different. Moreover, the 10-year-old child has dreams of her own, right? She has lived life already to a degree, and she wants to graduate from eighth grade, she wants to go to high school, she wants to get married, et cetera, et cetera. So again, none of those things, none of those reasons are reasons to say, well, therefore it's okay to kill 
the embryos. But those are considerations that, that make sense of why it is permissible to rescue, say, the 10-year-old child uh, rather than the embryos in a situation in which you can't rescue both. Yeah, I, I would tell uh, my, my students when this would come up, I'd give them a scenario. I, I said, imagine there, there are five Spockians, we'll call them. It's a particular race, right? And they uh, don't have much emotion <laughs> uh, or, or, or care much one way or the other if they're going to live or not. And uh, they, they don't really you know, feel pain, uh, at least in any sort of severe way. And uh, then you have another child in another room. Uh, and let's say that the, the child is crying out for its mommy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it, and it's just wondering as it's being uh, engulfed with smoke if this is it, you know, and wh where, where's uh, the child's mom. And so, you know, if you save the child in this case, again, uh, I, I would be inclined to save the child in this case. That says nothing about the these Spockians and whether they're rational creatures or you know anything like that. So yeah, would would you agree with that sort of uh, scenario as well? Being analogous. Yeah, that's, or? An, that's an interesting example. Um, I think I think I would agree. I think I would agree. I mean, part of again when you're rescuing people, that is no judgment on the innate human dignity of the people that you don't rescue. Right. So to take a slightly different example. If there was a burning house and I could only save my own daughter, or I could save whatever, somebody else's daughter, uh, right. well, that's not at all me saying, oh, the other person's daughter is not a person, can be killed, I don't care about her, I hope she dies. Well, no, it's like I have particular ties and cares for my own daughter. And so I prioritize her well being over the well being of people I don't know. And again, that's not to say that people I don't know aren't as much persons as my daughter, they certainly are. It just, right. in virtue of being her father, I have particular ties and particular concern for her. So again, yeah. I think it's a big error to, to, to move from a triage case where you can only rescue some and therefore say, well, the ones you don't rescue, well, clearly they don't matter. I would say clearly that doesn't follow, right? It, it can be the case that they matter as much as the one that you save. Yeah, I'm saving my kids. So <laughs> yeah. I'm saving my one kid, even if it's a couple others, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, Mike, I'm going to... Go ahead and pass the, the ball to you, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Dr. Case, I, want, I recently was listening to a podcast where two philosophers were talking about the, the Don Marquet um, uh, essay and some of his work. And they were both pro-choice, uh, both, both held to the pro-choice position. And what was interesting was they, they talked about the essay and then they said, you know, we, we find this fairly convincing and we, we uh, you know, we're not sure where the holes in this argument are. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we just have this strong intuition that the pro-choice position is correct. And so, obviously, you know, within ethics now, I think eth ethical intuitionism is making, you know, is becoming more and more popular. And so what do you say to the pro-choice uh, um, advocate who says, well, I just have this strong seemings, moral seemings that, uh, that this is, that, that, you know, that the pro-choice position is correct. Uh, even in light of the evidence? Um, I guess what I'd say is that we can recognize from past cases that people's strong intuitions can be mistaken. So for instance, if you ask someone, what would you have done if you had been a white slave owner in the South in 1855? So there's some people who say that slavery should be abolished, and there's other people who say that slavery is okay, which side would you be on? And most people would say right away, well, of course I'd be against slavery. I and mean, it's obviously true that you know, slavery is problematic. But is it really obviously, or so obviously true that everyone thinks that way? I mean, clearly if you look at history, that's not, not the case, right? There's all kinds of intelligent people who had the intuition that slavery was okay. Now, why did they have that intuition? I would say that in many cases, it was because they had personal interest in coming to a certain conclusion, that it would be difficult socially to come to a different conclusion, that coming to a different conclusion would have cost them and made them change their lives in ways that would have caused them to uh, not fit in socially, would have caused them to lose money maybe, would have caused them to lose pleasure, position, etc. And so when we have a position that is um, reinforced, you might say, by our own personal interest, then that 
should cause us to question that intuition with greater rigor. In other words, if there's some view that I hold and then there's great incentives that are aside from the merits of the case for me holding that view, that should cause me to reconsider uh, my view if I'm an honest person. Yeah, yeah, and I imagine if you uh, show them uh, what abortion looks like in pictures, perhaps maybe their intuitions might, uh, they might have different seemings, so. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and another way to think about it is outside of abortion, almost everyone recognizes the value of the life of human beings in utero. I mean, think about if there's a car accident and a pregnant woman is involved. Right. I mean, no one says, oh, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter that she's pregnant, you know, let's just, you know, and not care for that, that child who's injured. Um, if you think about capital punishment, right? No one virtually would uh, commit capital punishment on a woman who is pregnant. Almost everyone would recognize, oh, we should allow that. Um, when doctors see pregnant women, they recognize outside of the abortion context that there are two patients involved, not just one. And finally, even in our legal system, um, our legal system does recognize the worth and value uh, and rights of unborn human beings. So unborn human beings, for instance, um, are protected by law outside of the abortion context. So in California, there's an uh, infamous case of a woman uh, who was murdered, pregnant woman who was murdered by her husband. Um, and the husband was charged and convicted of double murder, the murder of his wife and the murder of the child in utero. So again, you know, to be pro-life is really to be consistent with fundamental intuitions outside of the scope of the abortion uh, debate. And again, I think that, that we recognize that. So one of the pro-choice arguments that sometimes people give is, look, women have a right to control their bodies. But one of the big problems with that view, of course, is that the right to control your body in every other circumstance is limited by the rights of other people. In other words, I don't have a right to control my body, and that means, well, I can slap Tyler around, I can punch Mike in the face. Well, no, I mean, my rights to control my body stop when somebody else's body begins. We don't have a right to control our body and walk around naked or have sex in public or go to the bathroom in public. There's a million things that we, uh, we may not do legally and we ought not to do morally. So, you know, the, the, the reality is that in the case of a potential abortion, there are two human beings involved. And so the pro-life view is that we should love both, we should protect both, and we should help both to flourish as best we can. Yeah, that's good. That's convicting from my own ethical um, thinking, because I, I kind of fall back on intuitionism a lot. So uh, I need to be more consistent. Um, I, I, again, I'm going back to that there's this, I feel like on the pro-choice side, there's this demarcation issue, right? Where it's like, where, where, where is, when is it okay to have abortion? When is it not? Uh, and there's a host of counterexamples, right? To show that, that that's problematic at, at any point. What do you think of the Judith Thompson violinist type counterexamples that say, well, okay, um, let's, let's just say that it, um, uh, the, the fetus is a person or, or, or does have moral status. It doesn't matter because um, you know, because of its location, or, or not to beg the question, but I guess, what do you think of the Judas Thompson type uh, counterexamples to to the pro life argument? Yeah, so Judith Jarvis Thompson has, of course, as you mentioned, this famous violinist analogy, and the idea is that uh, abortion is like a woman or a man waking up one day and then being in the hospital attached to a famous violinist, and the idea is that um, even though the violinist is a person. We ought not to, um, the violinist nevertheless doesn't have a right to use our body to maintain, um, to maintain life. Now, I'm not very convinced by those kinds of arguments, and I've already said a little bit about why. I mean, my right to control my body is limited by the well-being of other people's bodies. But in addition to that, I think these violinist type arguments fail because they fail to draw the important distinction between intending to kill someone on one hand and foreseeing that someone's going to die on the other hand. So if I uh, snip the cords that connect me to the violinist, the violinist dies of the violinist's own underlying health problem. By contrast, in abortion, the abortionist is intentionally killing 
the human being in utero. In fact, if the human being in utero doesn't die, you have what's sometimes called a botched abortion or a failed abortion. In other words, the whole goal of the procedure is to end the life of the human being in utero. Mm. Moreover, the relationship between uh, a strange violinist and myself is radically different than the relationship between a mother and her own child or a father and her own child. So if a father and his own daughter, say, uh, ended up getting stranded in the cabin, let's say that uh, the mom leaves them and, the, and there's an there's a avalanche and they're snowed in and they can't, you know, the, the father has to be stuck in the cabin with the, with the kid. Um, no one would say, well, the father has a right to control his own body. So if he wants to just play video games and allow that child to die, then that's perfectly fine. I mean, you can't force him to use his own body to, you know, feed the baby, change the baby's diapers, take care of the baby. You'd say, well, no, of course not. In fact, fathers have very strict duties to help their own biological children. And that's why in civilized countries, biological fathers are forced to support their own children. They have to pay child support, for example. And it doesn't matter if the dad didn't want to be a dad, if he used condoms, if the woman said she was on the pill. None of that matters. If you're the biological father, you have a duty to support your own biological children. So in a similar way, I think that biological mothers have a responsibility to support their own biological children. And so it is especially wrong, uh, given the duties that parents have to their vulnerable minor children, it's especially problematic not to fulfill those duties and to even go beyond not fulfilling the duties to help, but to go all the way to harming your own uh, son or daughter. I think that uh, those violinist analogy type of arguments uh, don't really work because they fail to take into account the distinctive duties of fathers and mothers to their own biological children. Yeah, that's really good, really good. Um, I guess just to end it off, um, obviously society really very polarized right now and uh, th this being one of the issues, right? So when we take this from kind of our philosophical discourse to political, everyday on the ground discourse. Um, what does it look like? What, you know, what is, what's the, the best way to have this conversation in public, right? What's the best way to, is there any, is there any give and take here? G given the, the gravity of the moral outcomes on both sides, it seems hard to me when I think about this, this, this issue politically, that there's much room to give, right? So I don't know, what, what do you think about this issue politically and how we have this discourse? Well, I think that anyone with an open mind is open to the possibility of learning new things. And so there's many, many people, I know many of my students have never really heard the uh, pro-life argument. And so I think that people that have an open mind are willing to learn new things. And when you learn new things, it makes sense to change your view. And so that's true of the pro-life issue. And changing people's minds, I think, is really absolutely central. Um, we can talk about politics, and it does matter, of course, who the president is. It matters who the Supreme Court is. But it matters even more, you might say, what is in the minds and hearts of people. Because if the minds and hearts of people were changed en masse, that is going to influence and change the law. And in fact, the most important thing is changing the hearts and minds of people. because whatever the law is, there's always some people who disobey the law. And so what we have to aim for, I think, is a conversion of minds and hearts so that abortion is not simply illegal, but really unthinkable. 